at 12. The news at 5 starts right now. First at five, it's official, something that has never happened in U.S. history. The House of Representatives voting out of the job, the speaker. He's losing the top spot in the House. The decision for him to vacate the speaker's seat coming with a vote of 216 to 210. Yeah, the result upheaval in the House. Members of McCarthy's own party turning against him, as well as some moderate Democrats. ABC's M. Win on Capitol Hill with more on the fallout. In a historic vote, the House ousting Speaker Kevin McCarthy from his post. The office of Speaker of the House of the United States House of Representatives is hereby declared vacant. Florida Representative Matt Gates spearheaded the motion to vacate the chair, which triggered the process that led to McCarthy being voted out. Chaos is Speaker McCarthy. Chaos is somebody who we cannot trust with their word. The House is narrowly divided. McCarthy could only afford to lose four Republicans. Before the vote, Democratic House leader Hakeem Jeffries sent a letter to his members informing them he and other leaders would vote to oust McCarthy. We encourage our Republican colleagues who claim to be more traditional to break from the extremists in the chaos in the dysfunction, in the extremism. As the process played out, McCarthy first bringing up a motion to table Gates's resolution, but it failed. The next vote on the motion to vacate following immediately after. McCarthy losing that vote. This is historic and entirely without precedent. So a new acting speaker will take the gavel for a short term, chosen from a list McCarthy submitted to the House clerk in January. When the House is prepared to move forward, a new speaker election will take place. Some saying that time-consuming process coming just a month and a half away from another potential government shutdown isn't good for anyone. This all coming after McCarthy worked with Democrats to pass a spending bill to keep the government open until mid-November. At the end of the day, if you throw a speaker out that has 99% of their conference, I think we're in a really bad place for how we're going to run Congress. This speakership showdown underscoring major divisions among House Republicans. M. Wynn, ABC News, Washington. So what about Texas Republicans? Well, Senator John Cornyn of Texas taking to social media following the historic vote on X or Twitter. He posted, quote, a handful of House members just wanted to blow up the institution and themselves in the process. Sad, end quote. By the way, Texas House Republicans that voted joined Cornyn in that they all voted to keep McCarthy in place as the speaker. Of course, in the Senate, Cornyn didn't actually have a vote in this. Moving by one of those votes cast to oust McCarthy was Democratic Texas Congressman Henry Cuellar. He was back at work today after getting carjacked in D.C. last night. That crime happening also right there about a mile away from Capitol Hill. Garrett Berger with Cuellar's advice in this situation to get through it safely. The office of Speaker of the House of the United States House of Representatives is hereby declared vacant. With the Speaker of the House ousted today, it was an historic day on Capitol Hill. But Monday night was probably more personally eventful for Texas Congressman Henry Cuellar. So they said they wanted my car. I said, sure, you got to keep calm in those situations. And then they took off. The Democrat from Laredo says he was arriving at his place in D.C. when he was carjacked. The U.S. Capitol Police, which are leading the investigation, say Cuellar told investigators three masked men swarmed his vehicle, put guns in his face, and demanded his keys. I do have a black belt, but I uh, recognize when you got three, uh, three guns, uh, I looked at one with a gun, another one with a gun, a third one behind me. Capitol Police say the congressman's phone and Toyota crossover were later recovered in two separate locations. The car was found abandoned. And what really got me upset was they took my sushi. But anyway, that's something else. Uh, and they did recover the sushi after all. A witness said that based on their build, the carjackers may have only been about 16. D.C. Metro Police online statistics show carjackings have been up in the nation's capital since early in the pandemic. And nearly two-thirds of carjacking arrests this year have involved kids. Uh, we, we have to find out why we've seen the increase in juveniles uh, involved in these offenses like we did. Cuellar made sure to thank police when talking with media. I got three brothers in law enforcement, so I certainly appreciate the, uh, the good work that the police did last night. The Capitol Police Chief says they have a number of leads. Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News.
Two other news at five and Abilene Schneider, the woman charged in a deadly dog attack that killed an elderly man earlier this year, makes her first court appearance today. Schneider and her husband, Christian Moreno, are charged because they own the dogs that killed Ramon Najera in February on Depla Street off Highway 90. Najera, along with his wife, brutally attacked by a pack of dogs. The judge today asking Schneider's lawyer to speak with her husband's attorney to see if they would agree to try their cases together. Last week, Christian Moreno made his first hearing, uh, made his first hearing appearance. Both Schneider and Moreno facing a second degree charge of dangerous dog attack resulting in death and a third degree charge of injury to the elderly. Both are set to be back in court on October 25th. New at five, the man who died after being ejected from his truck during a crash on South Florida Street has now been identified. According to the Bear County Medical Examiner's Office, he is 58-year-old Rodolfo Corpus Montes. Police say that on Sunday, Montes was driving a blue truck and pulled out in front of another uh, white pickup truck. Both trucks colliding. Montes was thrown from his vehicle and died at the scene. The driver of the other truck was not injured. A woman of power sending a reminder that domestic violence can happen to anyone. Some of uh, my earliest memories are of my mother being severely beaten. State Representative Josie Garcia only recently started sharing her story of domestic violence and has found liberation. That's why she agreed to be the main speaker at this year's Collaborative Commission on Domestic Violence Symposium. People tune in from all over the country to hear the latest on local domestic violence response and advocacy. We have to break the stigma on family violence, on, on past traumas, um, release people from the shame, and really hold people accountable as well to one not offending again. The symposium runs this Thursday and Friday. It is virtual and it is free to the public. Just head over to the Collaborative Commission's website to register. And we have that link on ksat.com. The start of October ushering more in more than just changes to the weather. We now see the official name change of the Spurs home court to Frost Bank Center. See it there? Crews were out early today, removing the letters in the AT&T Center sign and replacing them. Last month, the arena officially renamed the Frost Bank Center after the Spurs had been seeking a new arena naming rights sponsor since November of 2021 when AT&T decided not to renew its naming rights deal. As far as AT&T Parkway being renamed, apparently it's going to happen. The street signs will take longer to replace because the city has to go through the process of approving the change first. The signage change on the arena comes 22 days from the start of the season, which is set for October 25th. A nine year old girl in New York is OK and back with her family after a massive two day search for her. the dramatic disappearance from a bike trail brought to an end with a ransom note and a fingerprint that print leading New York police to say it to her alleged kidnapper, 47 year old Craig Nelson Ross Jr. SWAT teams found Ross in his camper and found the little girl hidden in a cabinet cupboard. Ross is now charged with kidnapping. The parents of Oxford High School shooter Ethan Crumley will stand trial. The Michigan Supreme Court declined to consider Jennifer and James Crumley's appeal. They're facing four counts of involuntary manslaughter in connection with their son's actions. Crumley's parents argued unsuccessfully that the charges have no legal justification. They should not be held responsible for their son's actions in November of 2021. Taking a look outside with your traffic authority cameras. This is I-10 at Culebra. You can see traffic there starting to kind of stack up, but still moving, but slower and slower. Nothing on the radar screen in our area this afternoon. As for temperatures, 95 the high. That makes it 118 consecutive 90 plus degree days in a row here in San Antonio. That's an all time record. The average is 86 and I do think we'll actually be dipping below average for a change in the days ahead. That's what the cold front that's headed our way. We'll talk more about that temperature drop in a moment. First of all, right now we're 97 in Floresville, 98 currently Panamaria, Maria, Myco 94 along with Bull Verde, Windcrest at 92 degrees. A quiet evening. We could have a stray 
highly isolated shower through sunset. Otherwise, a clearing sky 83 degrees at 10 o'clock by midnight. We're at 81 a southeasterly wind at 10 to 15 miles per hour. More on the timing of the cold front when the cooler, less humid, more fall like air arrives. And of course, the rain with the front in just a bit. Thank you, Adam. Straight ahead, as expected, the auto worker strike is taking a major chunk out of the bottom lines of the manufacturers. Just how many billions one economic group says that they have lost and who else is losing big money as the strike continues? I'm Myra Arthur here in the newsroom, and here's what we're working on for the news at 6 o'clock today. A St. Mary's Law student accuses her boyfriend of kidnapping her and burglarizing her home. But months after those charges were rejected by prosecutors, she's the one in handcuffs. Can you stop violating my privacy and get out of me? Get out of my way with the camera. Coming up at 6 o'clock, Melanie Hagner's recent history of arrests and why an attorney says Hagner is weaponizing the law to target her ex. Plus, a family fighting for justice. Their loved one was killed in an alleged drunk driving accident, but almost three years later, the case is on hold. We'll explain how a high-powered defense attorney has been able to keep the defendant out of jail. And 11 days away from the annual solar eclipse, you might have heard you need to have glasses to view it and protect your eyes, but what about your camera? How to protect your smartphone, too? All that and more today on the News at 6. Thank you, Myra. They were discharged for refusing to get the COVID-19 vaccine. The majority of those military service members have not returned to the service since the military mandate was lifted. According to the data by the military branches, only 43 service members out of 8,000 have sought to rejoin. It comes eight months after the vaccine mandate was officially repealed. It was rescinded as part of the National Defense Authorization Act. Many Republicans have argued the vaccine mandate hurt efforts to recruit and retain members. Experts also suggest younger troops may have just left and found other careers, while older troops saw it as a reason for early retirement. The United Auto Workers strike costing them more than $3.9 billion. That's just in the first two weeks of the strike. According to the Anderson Economic Group, companies who make cars lost $1.12 billion. Suppliers lost an estimated $1.29 billion, while dealers and customers lost $1.2 billion. More than 18,000 auto workers are now on the picket lines, making the second week costlier than the first. Direct lost wages add up to $325 million, but many of the workers on strike or who have been laid off could be eligible for the union's strike pay of $500 a week. Take a live look outside right now. What was a cloudy overcast? Some places rainy Monday gives way to a sunny Tuesday, Adam. Yeah, and I think tomorrow's going to be similar. It's the cold front we're focusing on for Thursday, its arrival. But don't expect abrupt immediate changes with this cold front. It's going to arrive around midday, but the cooler and less humid air really won't be noticed until Friday night and especially the weekend. Rain? Best shot is going to be Thursday. Take a look at our rain chances tomorrow. I give us a 20% chance. Just a few isolated pop up showers, maybe a few thunderstorms here and there. It's Thursday throughout the day. We notice we have it at 70% so widespread. It's not going to be raining continuously all day on Thursday, but intermittent showers and storms coming and going through South Central Texas are likely. And overall, we have, I think, the possibility between a half inch and one and a half inches for a good chunk of our area. A few showers could linger into Friday morning. I think Friday is generally going to be dry. And then this weekend, mainly just clouds that'll be teasing us. Here's a look at the satellite and radar. Overall activity closer to Houston today. Some heavy rainfall there. Dip in the upper level flow. That's helping to make that cold front and push it through our neck of the woods come Thursday. Out ahead of that trough in the plains, you've got the showers starting to develop and they're right along that cold front. But let's skip ahead with our future cast to the day on Thursday. And of course, this is still a generalized view of what could happen. Don't expect everybody to wake up to rain. But as I said before, periodically through the day, we'll have the opportunities where rain is likely to come and go for most of us in most neighborhoods. 
Notice by Thursday evening starts to push south and then by Friday morning south of Highway 90 we could have a stray shower, but most of us I think will be dry throughout the entire day on Friday. Many rain gauges I think have a good chance of around an inch of rain. So cross your fingers for your neighborhood. It all really depends on where some of the heaviest downpours are going to set up. Let's talk temperatures and temperature changes with the front. 96 right now. We're feeling the heat. So our new high temperature actually 96. Dew point of 67, making it feel like it's four degrees warmer than the air temperature. We will wipe away the humidity, but it's not going to happen until Friday night. Again, the changes will be gradual with this front, not immediate, not the kind of fall cold front that hits and you notice it right away. Mm -mm, not that kind. Still 90s for us, some 80s in the Hill Country, Fredericksburg, for example, at 88. The cold fronts out there, it's not the most noticeable front on the map but it's up in the Great Plains. It's just developing right now. This is the day it's coming together. Behind it currently some temperatures in anywhere from the 50s to 70s behind that cold front, and we will have a noticeable temperature drop, but again, it's gonna mainly be noticed by this upcoming weekend. So tomorrow morning, 75 at 7 a.m. By noon, near 90, 94 the high temperature, that 20% chance of some afternoon or early evening showers or non-severe storms. High temperatures, mid 90s for most of us. Floresville, 96, 94 in Hondo and Canyon Lake, New Braunfels, 95, a few degrees lower in the hill country. But look what happens. Mid 80s Thursday and Friday, by this weekend, when the most noticeable changes are here, our afternoon highs should be in the mid to upper 70s. Still some uncertainty with the exact number, so check back for updates. Also, low humidity this weekend. Crisp air in place. Ooh, sounds like fall. Thank you. All right, it was nice of the Rangers to not only win, but you know get done in time so we could have our 5 o'clock show, Mary. You know, a lot of people were probably at work when this game started, yeah. so luckily for you, we will have highlights coming up of the Rangers AL wildcard series shutout victory over the Tampa Bay Rays. Plus, the Roadrunners are back in action this weekend after their much needed bye week. The MLB postseason is underway and this afternoon the Texas Rangers are in St. Petersburg, Florida for their best of three AL wildcard series against the Tampa Bay Rays. Second inning, Josh Young at the plate with runners at the corners. The sack fly brings in Nate Lowe, and just like that, the Rangers lead 1-0. It's now 2-0 in the sixth. With two on, Tampa Bay's afternoon riddled with sloppy play and errors. Corey Seager's liner to center drives in two runs for Texas after that bad play, and then errant throw to third. And that's how it would end. Texas wins game one in shutout fashion, 4-0. to zero. The Rangers will go for the series sweep tomorrow with first pitch at 2.08 here on KSAT 12. A bye as early as week five turned out to be perfectly timed for the UTSA football team who came out of its non-conference schedule with a less than ideal one and three record. But it's not too late to turn things around by any means. The Roadrunners make their AAC debut this weekend against Temple and the team is optimistic given its proven track record in conference play. Both sides of the field will be dealing with injury woes. UTSA has been without its receiver, Corian Clark, linebacker Trey Moore, and quarterback Frank Harris. Inconsistent football teams don't get taken care of during practice. They got to practice harder. We're airing on the edge of physicality right now, not, not on the uh, the side of um, being too careful. It's too early in the year. I mean, our last three years we've had bye weeks, you know, week nine, so different kind of mindset, but we're not a real good football team right now, and um, we've got to get better, so we got to practice and, and get physical, and you, you don't stop the run by not being physical, and you don't run the football without being physical. The Roadrunners' one and three start is the worst record through four games in the Jeff Trailer era. We'll see if UTSA can turn things around when the team kicks off against the Owls at Lincoln Financial Field this Saturday at one o'clock in the afternoon. So I'm listening to Coach Trailer and I'm thinking the whole time, for some <laughs> weird reason, the way my mind works, Olivia Newton-John's "Let's Get Physical" as he was talking about. Oh yeah, physical. <laughs> I know. I just, it's not right. Too physical. <laughs> we'll be right back. 
Before we go, we want to give you a look outside on this uh, commute home. This is 410 at Blanco Road, and you can see the access road. And moving along slowly there as cars try to get on the highway there. Moving a bit slower, but no backups here. Yeah, this is I-10 in Frio, and you can see the lower and upper levels of I-10 as you head towards downtown. Very busy, kind of crawling along there, but no major accidents to tell you about. It's just as I-10 heads towards I-35 there. Adam. All right, let's take a look at our temperature drop when it comes to morning low temperatures, which are usually right around sunrise. We'll still be in the 70s the next few days in the morning, so more of the same. By Friday near 70, once that cooler, less humid air settles in, we could be talking upper 50s by Sunday and Monday at sunrise. That'd be the coolest since May 1st. Happy fall, y'all. Thanks for watching. See you at 6. World News is next.